Welcome and Happy New Year from all of us at 5 by 15. Um, January the 18th, I think it's known as Blue Monday, and I think this might be the strangest start to the year that any of us have experienced, but we are delighted and very, very excited to be joined by an incredible lineup tonight for our first event of the new season. And thank you all for joining us. We have 400 people tuning in and it is a stellar lineup. Do tweet us, let us know what you think. And a thank you to everyone for being part of this. Tonight, we're gonna to be traveling across Europe from Glasgow to Madrid to 16th century Amsterdam with some incredible storytellers um, who I think are more important now really than ever before. We're gonna be celebrating the arts in all its forms from writing to painting and indeed theater and public performance, which is very much on the note of our first two speakers. So first up, we have the story of the most ambitious and adventurous work of art that we've ever heard about. In 2021, um, presented by Good Chance, The Walk will see little Amal, a 3.5 meter puppet of a young Syrian refugee girl, walk 8,000 kilometers across Europe, focusing attention on the needs of young refugees and bringing together artists and community groups, humanitarian organizations and cultural institutions. To tell us about it, we have theater director, film, and television director and producer Stephen Daldry, who's known for movies such as Billy Elliot and The Hours, and Amir Nizar Zoibi, artistic director of The Walk, who's also artistic, was an artistic director of The Young Vic and is an award-winning writer and theatre director. So over to you, Stephen, and welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Stephen Daldry, and I'm the chairman of the Good Chance Theatre. Uh, before I introduce uh, Nizar Zawabi, who, talk, who will talk a little bit about the walk, I just thought I'd give you a context of what Good Chance Theatre actually is, for those of you who don't know. Good Chance Theatre started in the great refugee migrant crisis of 2015. It came out of a group of colleagues deciding to engage with the crisis that was unfolding on the border with France and the UK in Calais, where a ramshackle migrant stroke refugee camp was beginning to be built and emerge. Two of those of that group, Joe Robertson and Joe Murphy, collectively known as the Joes, went down to bear witness and decided that the best response was to build a theater. Now you may ask what on earth is a theater doing in a refugee camp? And indeed many people did ask that. The question was simply answered by putting this geometric dome up. It was a dome that we found in Hebden Bridge. It was driven down to Calais. And almost on the first night it was put up in the camp, the question was answered. There's a variety and a huge number of people gathered in the dome for the first time to celebrate the very act of being alive in what was already one of the most distressing and disturbing places in Europe. The dome survived for a year before the French authorities finally destroyed it. And during that time, it became very much a town hall within the camp, a town hall where, yes, artistic endeavors were made, were, were created, were followed, were pursued in all its different forms. But it was also a town hall in the sense it was a place that people could gather. It was a place that was not affiliated to any one particular nationality or religion, where people, it was a free space, if you like, run by the Joes who went there for, I think, just a few weeks and stayed eight months at the end of the, end of the whole journey. Um, and it became a center of creativity. Now, the, again, back to this question of what is a theater doing in a refugee camp, perhaps the, the answer is, well, what is a theater in the first place? There were many answers to that question. Perhaps the most interesting, one of the interesting answers came from one of the people that turned up in that camp. Um, his name is Majid Adin. He was a refugee from Iran who was an artist in his home country who ended up uh, stuck in Calais. He asked that question, what on earth is a theater doing in this refugee camp? Um, he started drawing. Um, he was an artist. He started drawing, just drawings of his journey so far. Eventually he made the journey over to the United Kingdom and became a celebrated artist in the United Kingdom where he made animated stories about the journey and the, using the work he'd made actually in the dome, uh, Good Chance Dome in Calais. These animated stories, we helped him with, and actually he 
put them together to make a pitch for Elton John's Rocket Man music video. Elton had never actually made a, a video. And uh, Majid won the competition to create the Rocket Man official video to Elton John's song, which is now being viewed by 70 million people worldwide. He actually also has his own very successful artist and animation studio in the United Kingdom. He's one example of people who found the dome a place where they could start to piece together or understand the journeys that they've made and to understand or to question the simple question of what is my life now? What is, if your story is interrupted, if you are in, if you like, as a refugee suspended, how do you start piecing together the past? What is your present? And can you possibly imagine the future? Whatever art form you can choose, people came together to share stories and start piecing together what their hopes and their dreams and indeed their past was, if, if you like, to create a narrative. The dome itself then traveled when the camp was destroyed to Paris, to various areas around Paris, starting on the periphery near La Chapelle, but moving down into the center of Paris with the support of the mayor of Paris and the different cultural, culture, ministry of culture in France. The Dome has appeared in the United Kingdom, bringing communities together. And just before the pandemic, we were actually working on the Mexican-US border in Tijuana to create a center there for refugees, where again, they could come and try to understand the simple expression of artistic creativity within possibly appalling circumstances. The Walk is our next major project. And the Walk is a journey of a little girl, a little girl who is walking her name is Amal. She is walking from the Turkish-Syrian border. She's walking across Turkey. She's walking across, she then crosses the Aegean. And she walks across Greece. She then travels across right the way up Italy, moving into France, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, back into France. She crosses the Channel and then moves uh, through the South Coast, through Canterbury, up to London, eventually completing her journey with the help of the Manchester International Festival of Theatre, obviously in Manchester. The, to talk about the walk, well, the first thing to say about the walk is she is a little girl. She's an unaccompanied minor that we're walking with. The extraordinary thing about a little Amal, unlike many other little unaccompanied minors, obviously, she is in fact a puppet. She's a three and a half meter puppet. And we will be walking with her from July this year. The question, uh, well, the first person to I'd like to introduce to the artistic director of the walk, who's here, um, Nizar Zouabi, who's speaking to us from uh, Jaffa. Uh, Nizar is a Palestinian writer and uh, theater maker and has intimate experience his whole life and for indeed his whole past working with refugees. Um, the first question I've got, I know your parents um, themselves or your grandparents were refugees. Nizar, on a personal note, do you describe yourself as a refugee? Or do you, how would you describe yourself? Well, um, I'm a Palestinian um, from my father's side. I'm a Jew from my mother's side. So I think between these two narratives, um, the word refugee pops up very often. So I'm not a refugee because I live in my land, but maybe my land is no longer my land. So I am partly a refugee. So it's a, it's a complicated, question. I think what what does it mean to be a refugee is a very complicated question because it's to do with a moment in time. Um, it's not an it's not an ongoing status. It's a condition. It's a it's a condition created by circumstances, but then you're not a refugee anymore and you're something else. Um, and I think that's what the walk is really about this transitional phase between somebody that's uh, in at home to somebody who's in a different territory. He's not necessarily a refugee for, for the rest of his life. What is he then? Um, is he a former refugee? Is he a re rehabilitated refugee? So it's a, it's a big question. Obviously where I come from in my country, this is, the idea of being a refugee has been the power that shaped this country. You know, refugees from Europe um, fleeing World War II um, created Israel on the expense, on, on the lands of Palestinians who became themselves refugees. And because of my complicated family heritage, I have 
Holocaust survivors on one side and the victims of that same uh, odyssey on the other side. So it's a, it's a very complicated question. Little Amal is a young unaccompanied minor who is looking for her mother. She is on a journey and that's what we're doing. We're walking and she's, we're walking with a little girl, a little unaccompanied girl who is looking for her mother, who eventually in some form, she comes to some relationship with uh, in the United Kingdom. But what is just, I, for those that don't know, can you just tell me a little bit more about the war? What is it? Is it a protest? Is it a, is it a march? Is it a festival? What, it, what is the walk? I, I think the best way to describe this is uh, an 8,000 kilometer long rolling festival of shared humanity, um, of hope. Um, this little girl who's a beautiful puppet created by the legendary Handspring Puppet Company um, is leading us through 65 different cities and communities. And in each community, we are creating uh, bespoke events with the city and the community and our partners. We're almost 200 partners now and counting are a mix of the best artistic institutions, but also civic society, um, rel religious figures, humanitarian organizations. So when we are creating a, an event in one of the cities that we walk across, we are creating content and creating events and art with many different walks of life. So obviously the refugee communities in these cities are very active in the design of the events. Um, <clears throat> And to all these unbelievable partners that we have across the route, the, the premise, the beginning of the conversation was very simple, is this nine-year-old is crossing through your town, how would you like to welcome her? And over the last year where we have been Zooming our partners endlessly, um, it's quite unbelievable the amount of generosity and creativity that's coming back um, to this proposition because people have come up with beautiful projects um, of how to welcome her or how to celebrate her. It's very important. It was very important for me that this walk is not about misery. She's not, uh, she's a very strong character somehow. I think that was like you, sh like you are when you're a nine-year-old that's crossing a continent alone. Um, but it's also about potential. It's about human potential. And this girl is full of culture and she's full of different smells and aesthetics of a, of a different place. And she's learning things constantly as she walks. So she's an evolving human being. Um, and we will only accompany a, a short phase in her life. That's how we, we, we we're thinking of this. We're walking with her for three months out of a, a very long, successful life that will um, come after that. So we're her guardians for a moment. We're just showing you some uh, images now of Little Amal. This is a prototype that we created uh, with the Handspring Theatre Company. You may know them, they created the, well, many productions, perhaps their most famous being War Horse. And here she is in, uh, just outside Cape Town. Uh, where we were walking with her just to experiment with the early prototypes. We also, just a couple of images about to come up, we brought her to London, where we were, she was learning to dance with different communities, and she, we walked her on the, uh, on the South Bank as well. There she is, and she's obviously very worried about the coronavirus there. She is, uh, just tell us a little bit about the practicalities, Nizar, of what, let's just talk about what actually this puppet is, because she's made by Handspring, how many teams of people, how big an operation is the, is little Amal herself? How many people are, are there who are animating this puppet? So the, from the beginning, the, the ask from Handspring was, was to create something that is low techie, which means that she's manageable and very human. She is bigger than life. Um, and she needs four, four puppeteers all the time. One is inside her on very tall stilts and carries her body on his shoulders. And then there's two puppeteers doing the hand motion and another puppeteer guarding her back. Um, so, she, so the rest of the puppeteers are safe. And, and they need to think as a, as a team 
and on the road, obviously, we'll have um, three different teams that will rotate so they can kind of keep up with uh, the events and the hardships of the, of the journey. It's quite a big so, operation, in other words. And the, I know uh, Adrian and Basil, who run the Handspring Theatre Company, talk about the, no the notion of empathy. The, what is empathy with a puppet? Can you talk a little bit about why? I mean, again, I know because we've been on these uh, experiments ourselves, but what is, why does she have such an extraordinary reaction? Why do people project onto her? Why do they feel for her? Why do they want to talk to her? Why is she such a potent symbol? Why is a puppet such a potent symbol? I, I think that the first thing is the puppet needs a leap of faith. Uh, in order for her to be alive, you need to believe she's alive. But from the moment that you do this leap of faith into giving her life, she becomes, um, she evokes a lot of things inside a spectator because she's not real, but by doing this leap of faith, you just made her real. So you're invested in her immediately uh, or else she's just, she's just an object. And obviously part, part of the brilliance of Handspring is that they created a figure that is very relatable um, and you immediately feel for her. So this act where you kind of project something on an, on an animate object and make it real and make it alive means you're already invested. There's also something, I think the puppeteers moving a man need a lot of empathy because they need to create an interaction with people. So they're projecting themselves on the puppet as well. So it's an interaction between two projections if you like, which is a very subtle thing, but when it happens, when it's real, it's absolutely fantastic to see. It's, you know, in our workshops, you see people relate to your children, uh, but also adults. Um, One of the things that I was most surprised about when, because little Amal does, we decided that little Amal wouldn't speak, but when, when she sometimes whispers things to people and you don't understand what it is, if you ask people, they'll tell you what she's saying. They will, they will, they will, what's she saying, do you think? And they will tell you exactly, they'll tell you all sorts of information about it. It'll be different from different people, but they sort of know where she's come from and where she's going. Can we, I know that you spent many, many months now, years even, talking to a variety of different groups uh, across Europe. And some of these groups are very, as you say, they're faith groups, they're church groups, they're, they're school, civic groups, and, uh, and uh, for what of a better way of describing it, uh, theater or artistic groups. But the, the scale of events changes, doesn't it? It's that some are very small and some are really very large scale events. Just, what, just can you answer the question? What, give me an idea of what actually is gonna happen. So she's gonna start walking. What, you know, okay, she's walking. What happens? When she arrives somewhere, give, can you, I know they're very different. Give us a flavor of what sort of uh, activities we've got planned. Um. We, we've got 65 cities and in some cities we have more than one event, but I'll try and give you kind of cherry picks. Um, in, in Izmir, we're working with the Yarn Cooperative, which is a huge uh, network for traditional dance in Turkey, and they will gather hundreds of their dancers to teach Amala Zayb dance. Um, in <clears throat> In Tarsus, which is in the city where St. Paul was born, she's going to be given a gift that will be taken by her to St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, in Athens, which is her first big capital city, she walks into the city, she's a bit lost and afraid. She ties a red yarn and starts walking and then is joined by a dance company, Kinetiras Dance Company, that also does the same thing. And suddenly there's a river of red yarn. And then by mass participation, uh, hundreds of people will join her in this march through uh, the center of Athens until she reaches a uh, central square and then she meets a minor tower, which is created by a puppetry company um, in Greece. Um, and they befriend each other and he shows her the rest of the city. So Athens is about conquering fear of the unknown. Um, <clears throat> in in Rome, she, after a long day of walking the streets of Rome, she goes to sleep in Piazza Farnese. And as she's falling asleep, she starts seeing dreams. And these dreams are actually 
uh, paintings by a Syrian artist, brilliant artist called Tamam Azam, who depicts the bombarded houses of Syria. After the war, he does these beautiful, beautiful, very poignant paintings, and they're projected on the walls of the piazza. So she wakes into this nightmare, but it's also an open air installation. Um, <clears throat> in, in Paris, we are creating a big refugee camp and each of these big white tents will have a soundscape from one of the countries that refugees come from. So you will walk around the camp and you can hear uh, a radio in Arabic or a, a hushed conversation between two lovers, um, a lullaby of a mother to a child. And they will also have shadow art projected on the walls by some quite amazing artists that are creating this with us. Um, in Marseille, we have a, it's one of the, I, they're not small, I call them precise. One of our precise events is Ammar El Bek, who's a gorgeous, gorgeous visual artist. Uh, chatting with me, he told me about the fact that when he was young, he loved to spend time in his um, uncle's tailor shop in Damascus, because that was the place where there were sounds and smells of different places because he'd bring hot couture from Paris and kind of copy the models and create the, the Messian version of that. Um, but then he became a refugee, Ammar, and while walking this route, his best friend became his jacket. So the jacket became his sense of identity, his sense of pride, and the thing that gave him warmth. And Ammar wants to hand sew a jacket for Amal and give it to her under the mirrors in the Marseille port. I don't know if, but there's a gorgeous statue in the Marseille port of mirrors. So he's going to create an installation where he tailors the jacket on her and tells her, tells her the story of his uncle's shop in Damascus. Um, if I hop over the English Channel and get to London, so in London she becomes 10 and celebrates a huge party. And in Manchester, in our big finale, she meets the memory of her mom and the community of Manchester welcomes her to stay and that's her big finale. Um, so that's pretty much a scope of some of our events. Thank you for giving us the thumbnail of uh, just some of the events. And I should add, there are many, many, many events. We are encouraging people to join us. Um, join us physically, but join us also online. And you can watch her, you can interact with her. And of course, you all the obvious elements to this uh, event, you can, you, can, uh, you can imagine what we're doing, from seeing through her eyes to interactive relationships with schools, um, and indeed uh, joining us we're on the journey itself when you can, as well as these big tentpole events uh, throughout Europe and indeed across the United Kingdom. We're running out of time. Daisy's gonna tell me that she's gonna put up on the chat a website, which will tell you all about the walk, what you can do, how you can support it, how you can follow her and how you can interact with her. Um, uh, but thank you so much, Nizar, for joining us today from Jaffa. Um, and uh, good luck with your vaccination program over there. That's going very well. I know Rosie really wants to talk about But uh, just uh, saying how great it is to see you and um, I'll see you very soon. But Daisy, thank you. That's, uh, that's the walk from us. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you, Nizar, for making that work for us. That was really magical. And it is one of the most inspiring projects that I've ever, ever heard about. And during the pandemic to be organizing that is the most amazing feat. So thank you to your amazing team for making this possible for us. And I hope that everyone watching will follow that link and find ways to support and be part of the project. Thank you. Um, and now um, we're very excited to welcome Kate Moss, who is coming back to 5 by 15. She's a Sunday Times bestselling author, and of course, also the founder and director of the Women's Prize for Fiction, but, um, or founder director, I think I should say. But this week, it is the publication of her hotly anticipated new novel, The City of Tears, which is an epic and gripping second novel in the burning Chambers series, bringing the 16th century vividly to life. And we're thrilled to have her here back with us at 5 by 15 to talk about it. It does also touch upon the theme of refugees and she is as well a magical storyteller. Welcome, Kate. Thank you very, very much for being with us. Thank you, Daisy. And it's just wonderful to be back. Absolutely wonderful to be back. So um, 
the book comes out tomorrow, but uh, the book started 10 years ago in Franschhoek in South Africa on the other side of the world. I arrived to do a book festival and wonderful experience to be able to travel and talk about storytelling. And I knew very little about the history of that part of the Cape. And I was coming into the town. And as we came along, I noticed a sign at the side of the road that said Longadoc. It was spelt with a Q, but it was still Longadoc, which is the region in Southwest France that I write about all my historical fiction in a way, a love letters to Carcassonne and Toulouse and the Longadoc. And then we kept on going. And I started to notice that the names of the wine farms were not in Cosa, not in Afrikaans, not in English, but in French. They were called La Grande Provence or Petite Provence. And this, I started to smell a rat. And then finally we got to the small town, beautiful white Dutch cable buildings. Uh, and the main street was called Huguenot Street. And I knew nothing about the history of that part of uh, South Africa. But when I had a moment, I went to the museum at the end of the road, the Huguenot Museum at the end of the road. And I went in and started to read the interpretation on the walls and discovered this that in the 17th century, after many, many refugees, Huguenot refugees had left France after hundreds of years of fighting, 1688, finally the revocation of religious freedom in France. They had gone to all sorts of places as refugees, but very predominantly England as it then had been, and now it was becoming England and Scotland. And of course, the Netherlands, the low countries, Amsterdam, Utrecht, Rotterdam, and there they had been welcomed. You know, little, little Holland, if you like, became a world power, partly because they welcomed in the refugees, the Huguenots from Paris, who brought with them their skills. And the people who were running the Cape, the people who had stolen the Cape uh, from the people whose land it was, realized that the land, the Dutch East India Company, realized that the land in the Cape was very similar to the land in Languedoc in Southwest France. And that being so, maybe they thought we could start planting vines here and make our own wine rather than shipping our wine all the way from Amsterdam and Rotterdam, all the way over the coast around Scotland because the channel was infested with pirates and they would often stop in the Canary Islands and then carry on down to the Cape um, and then go on to their so-called territories and colonies in the Far East. And so a letter went back from Cape Town to Amsterdam, to the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company saying, if there are any in our city, refugees from the Southwest of France and the South of France who are winemakers, who would like to chance their arm on going to the other side of the world, we will pay for your passage on a ship. We will pay for your family to go with you. We will pay for a French pastor to administer to your spiritual needs. And we will, when you arrive, sell you very cheaply uh, tools to, to, to grow vines. We will sell you vines. We will give you a, a bit, bit of land. And out of that, seven families, seven brave families accepted the invitation and they sailed. One of those ships was a ship called the Berg China that landed in the Cape on the 4th of August, 1688. And they made their way through Drakenstein and Pahl and Stellenbosch and finally to their way in Franschhoek. So as a writer of historical fiction, I put imaginary characters in front of real history. I write stories of war and the consequence of war, peace and the consequence of peace, faith and the consequences of faith. And I write stories about the Huguenot diaspora, about people being forced to leave the land that they love and find a new way of finding a home and living somewhere else. And of course, this is all fascinating. And if you're passionate about history, and I'm sure many of you are, just reading the interpretation on the wall of a museum can just set your world alight. But as a storyteller, that's not enough. There needs to be something that you can say that is more than simply the history itself. Because historical fiction, if it's anything, and why I think it matters, is about standing in other people's shoes. And it's about slipping between the gap of what we know and what we can imagine from history. So the moment came when I went outside of the museum into the graveyard and I walked under the extraordinary blue sky 
in and out of the graves. And I saw the French names, the de Villiers, the Dutois, the Jourdains, the Joubert's. And I saw all of the ways that those names started to be lost where the husbands died and the women then married an African settler or possibly a Lutheran settler, but still those French names were still there. And then the moment, the moment that every novelist wants when they're writing. I looked up and I looked up at the mountains that ring the town. There's like a beautiful wall of mountains, the Franchuk Mountains that surround this wonderful, once a frontier town. And those mountains, you know, they look like the mountains of Languedoc. They look like the mountains of the Ariège, where all of my historical characters have walked in many different periods of time, in the medieval time, in the 14th century, in the 19th century, in the modern day. And I suddenly thought this, what would it have felt like to have been a woman who had grown up your whole life hearing about the story of the land you were forced to leave, your family was forced to leave. If you had heard your mother and grandmother, great-great-grandmother, and the generations of women's stories going back 300 years from 1862, which is what it is now as you stand in the graveyard, to 1562 on the eve of the wars of religion that were to destroy France and rip the country in half and divide it into two sets of enemies, if you like, Catholic on one side and Huguenots on the other. But what if you'd grown up all of the time hearing those stories and you found yourself here and you looked up at those mountains and you thought, I could belong here. And that was it. That was where the beginning for a series, four books, started because I wanted and listening to the extraordinary story of Little Amal and the power, the importance of uh, the Sangat theater and the way that sometimes experiences that are very difficult to process. When you have theater, when you have artists, when you have puppetry, when you have painting, when you have dance, when you have music, when you have novels, sometimes the stories that matter most to us and we most want to absorb, the big emotions that matter, you can sometimes work more easily with on the pages of a novel because what happens there is that it no longer becomes a story about refugees. It no longer becomes a story about religious civil war. It no longer becomes a story about diaspora. It becomes a story about one girl and one boy and them falling in love and their families and their enemies and the generations that go down reliving those histories. So once I'd got this idea, I decided that I needed to go back to the beginning, of course, and I went back to the beginning of the Wars of Religion, 1562, uh, the 1st of March, a massacre that happened many, many, many hundreds of miles away from Carcassonne, where my lead family were living. Because what matters in religious war is that it is never about faith. It is always about power, about influence, about manipulation. It is always about demonizing the other. It is always about making people feel that they have to, for their own safety, possibly for their own life, decide that someone who is not the same as them is their enemy. But at the beginning of the Wars of Religion, and they were absolutely prosecuted, if you like, by a triangle at court, um, a rich Catholic family, the Guise family, Catherine de Medici and her sons repeatedly being the king, and the leaders of the what were called the War Huguenots, Coligny, all of these people at court were fighting for power and for prominence and for influence. But ordinary people in ordinary streets in Carcassonne, they wanted, and I still believe this despite everything, that most people want to live side by side with their neighbors. And so my lead character, Minu, in the first book, The Burning Chambers, goes to work that first morning in a bookshop, not knowing of the massacre many, many hundreds of miles away, but saying hello to her Jewish neighbors, to her Catholic neighbors, she's a Catholic, to her Protestant neighbors. In the City of Tears, which is the second book and follows on from that, it starts 10 years later. Uh, the royal family are prosecuting a wedding, and I say prosecuting because it has been very forced through by two powerful queens, Catherine de Medici and Jeanne d'Albret. There will be a wedding in Paris in August 1572 between the Huguenot uh, King of Navarre, Henry of Navarre, and the Catholic. Marguerite de Valois, who is the daughter of Catherine de Medici and sister to the king. My family, the Joubert family, I took the name from the graveyard, are trying to decide whether to go. 
Now, of course, any of you who know your history will at this moment be shrieking, do not go to Paris, because you will know that the most notorious engagement of the wars of religion is the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where maybe as many as 3,000 Huguenots were massacred in the course of the night on the 24th of August, 23rd to the 24th, and there were maybe 70,000 Huguenots were massacred the length and breadth of France in copycats that followed. But my family do go, and what is extraordinary about writing historical fiction is this, that sometimes you have all the research, you have the idea of the tone and the character of your novel, but you don't yet quite know what book you're writing until you're doing it. And when my family get to Paris, what I discovered was that it actually wasn't a story about war, and it was a story about being refugees and fleeing because they flee to the city of tears itself, Amsterdam. It actually was a story about a missing child. And this too is what matters about historical fiction, that we tend to think sometimes in the past that they did not feel things in the way that we would. But of course, we know that's not true because again, that's a version of demonizing the other. Again, it's the idea that they don't think like we do and therefore they don't matter as much. But people will look back on us in a hundred years time and maybe think some of our emotions didn't matter so much or we didn't feel things so keenly, but we know we did. So what I thought would happen in the City of Tears when you are in the middle of brutal and violent and absolutely crushing history, the massacre that will go down in history as a turning point in the fortunes of Europe. But what matters is that your child has gone missing. So I won't tell you anything else about the City of Tears, which I'm holding up because uh, we, you know, earlier uh, we were talking about Blue Monday, but I think it should be Orange Monday. Um, but the story is very dear to me because as I started to research, as I started to look into how many people went to Amsterdam, the ways in which French uh, Huguenots were pushed out of their own country. I felt as always, you know, the classic uh, Brothers Goncourt comment about history being a book that is yet to be written and a novel being history that could have been. And I think what matters about historical fiction is we learn the emotions that matter. We stand in other people's shoes. We can see our own lived experiences reflected back at us. But more importantly, we learn about empathy and compassion and the idea that every single person who has ever been forced from their home now, yet to come, sadly, and in the past, we all share that same commonality of humanity. And we want to be people that will reach out to other people and give them a home if they haven't got one and open up our doors. So if you buy uh, any of the books this evening, do support Newnham Bookshop. Uh, it's an incredible independent bookseller um, and they deserve all the support that any of us can give. But it's been a great pleasure to be here on the eve of my publication back at wonderful 5x15 and to share the platform, the screen, uh, with such wonderful other writers. But for now, uh, this is me, not from the City of Tears, but from my desk in Sussex, saying thank you for listening and hope to be back in real life uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. That was so brilliant and such a treat to have you with us on the eve of the publication of City of Tears. And thank you very, very much for that very generous shout out to New One Books, um, who we love. And thank you for being with us again. And yes, next time, we hope that we will see you in person um, after this very, very strange period. Um, that was brilliant and resonated so much with our first talk as well. Um, thank you. So next up, we are very excited to welcome Douglas Stewart to 5 by 15, who's joining us from New York. Um, of course, uh, Douglas is winner of the 2020 Booker Prize. Um, for his first novel, the sensational and incredibly moving Shogi Bain. And if you haven't read it, then you have to go and get a copy. Douglas was born in Glasgow and he studied at the Royal College of Art. And then he subsequently moved to New York where he became uh, a designer, a fashion designer. And um, Douglas is going to be in conversation tonight with Rosie Boycott from 5 by 15. And it is a huge honor to have you with us. Welcome Douglas. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Douglas, hello, and um, I echo Daisy's thank you. It's fantastic to have you. And I, like I suspect many, many people on this call are huge fans of your book. I read it and I think we all fell in love, both with Shuggy and with Shuggy's tormented, wonderful, ambitious, clever, glorious mother. 
to whom I have to say I've taken a huge shine. Um, but this book for you, I mean, you you published it in lockdown, you won the booker in lockdown. I mean, it must have been, and it was 10 years in the making. I mean, it must have been a really very strange experience that you've had over the last few months. Yeah, I because it's my debut novel, Rosie, I have nothing necessarily to compare it to, but it's certainly been very strange. And in fact, after 10 years of work, when Shuggy was first published, it was published the week before the pandemic and all the bookstores closed. So in a way, I actually was grieving him a little bit uh, at the beginning because he seemed like he would be swallowed by global events. And it was only really when Shuggy started to make the National Book Award long list and the Booker long list that he had a little bit of a revenant moment. But even all the wonderful things that have followed uh, on from then have felt a little surreal because I haven't been able to see my family or friends or but in fact, to get back to the city that Shaggy is set in. Yes, yeah, so Glasgow is, is a character as well as the other two characters who we'll come on to talk about in a minute. But Glasgow is huge in this story, isn't it? It is. And I think it's just a city that gave me so much inspiration. Uh, I'm proud to be Glaswegian, even when my childhood was difficult at times. I'm still proud uh, to be Glaswegian. And, and I think of Shuggy almost as a love letter to Glasgow. You know, it's not always a flattering love letter. Glaswegians don't stand to be falsely flattered. Uh, we would rather you just told us exactly what it was and tell us uh, directly. But Glasgow is certainly the backdrop for, for Shuggy and Agnes's love. And Shuggy Bay in the books is the foothill at the bottom of some really giants of Scottish literature. Uh, but those books, uh, when I think about Welsh or I think about Kelman or I think about Grey, mm -hmm. often focus on men on the post-industrial mm -hmm. landscape and, and men suffering with addiction. And I had wanted to really frame a woman, a mother, uh, and a young queer boy in that, in that narrative because uh, I felt like it was really overlooked. And very much both Chuggy and Agnes, they they are separate but apart, aren't they? I mean, their love for each other is so intense. And what I think is ex one of the many things that are extraordinary about the book is that neither of them feel any shame. That's right. And Agnes, actually, her rejection of shame is something that drives her further into isolation. Because as you said, she's a very complex character. She is glorious against the sort of the greys of the tenements. But she's brilliant. She's loving. She's determined. She's a little bit calamitous. Uh, uh, and she's seen often in the book as being too much. Uh, her mother tells her she's too much, that she should want less, that she should tamp it down. And she's not too much at all. She's just the world around her is almost not enough for her. But Agnes uh, has takes ultimate pride in her appearance and how she presents herself, how she hones her dialect to almost sound uh, a little better than, than her surroundings sometimes. And that uh, sets her up in opposition to a lot of people around her because, of course, when we see someone affecting airs and graces, some of our natural desire is to pull that person down to their natural level. And Agnes suffers from that in the community. But Shuggy is also othered quite quickly. Mm. Um, he has no, he's a very young child and he has no sense of his own sex or sexuality. But even people within his family just say, Oh, you are no right. What he's saying, Glaswegian, is you're no right. You're wrong. What, what is it about you? And in a way, um, he's a very effeminate, precocious, sensitive child. Um, and that is a threat to masculinity at the time. Yes, well, they, you do feel that they are both, they are both there. Um, and that Agnes's, um, your details about, say, her, the way she dresses um, and the way she drinks. I mean, your details about a woman going through alcoholism, living with alcoholism, which in the end kills her, mm. are so precise. I mean, how much of it is autobiographical? Well, I would say it was a, it's a work of fiction, but I always uh, say that I am the queer son of a single mother who lost her own battle with addiction. And so my own mother drank from my very earliest memories up until I lost her at 16 when I was at school one day, Rosie. And um, it wasn't that there was alcohol in the house every single day, but we either lived in fear of it or we lived in regret because we'd passed through it. And I certainly understand that sort of terrorism that comes with when you love a parent that's suffering uh, with addiction because you never quite know what you're coming home to. And you can leave in the morning and it can be a wonderful day and you can come home in the afternoon and everything's uh, gone terribly wrong. And so I write from the inside of those feelings, what it means to love and lose the person you love most in the world means the most to you. 
But when I sat down to write the book, it could never be a memoir because I understood the social time to be far too complex. And also really what it means to suffer from addiction, to be far too complex, to tell it from the lens of only one little boy. Mm -hmm. What I just goes through is too momentous. And so I wanted to, the characters, as soon as they came on the page, dwarfed my own experience. And the book goes back to the 40s, 1940s, and up to the 1990s. And so I could never have been in all those rooms. And I wanted the characters to tell you what it meant because there was too many important things happening in Glasgow at the time. So one of the thing, I mean, one of the main things that's going on all through is the sort of grinding effects of poverty. Mm. And I mean, things that I didn't know, you know, about how you could get money on Tuesday and then money again on a Friday. And, you know, as you say, normally when you read a lot of Scottish writers, it's about the blokes going off down the pub with that money. But in fact, Agnes is, of course, very hypnotized by trying to get to the off license or whatever her equivalent is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it was growing up uh, on I was raised myself on government benefits and I wanted the reader with actually not having any idea who the reader would be, Rosie, I wanted them to be in the room as much as possible. Yeah. I didn't want them to be able to do a drive by and gawp at this life and then go back to whatever consumed them in their own lives. If we were going to meet Agnes, we were going to sit with her, but there is an industry around poverty. There's ways that people exploit people who are poor, uh, clothing catalogs mm -hmm. or having to rent television as we did in the, as a child, as opposed to just buying your own television set. And it, of course, there's strategies that keep you in penury. Um, but Agnes is dependent on the social fabric. And it was a strong social fabric at the time uh, in the 70s and the 80s. We did look out for one another. And, and as well as the, the Bain family really suffering at that moment, people are suffering around them. I didn't want it to be this locked room drama where it's just one woman that's disintegrating because actually that wasn't true. Um, there were so many uh, suffering in Glasgow at the time. And so yes, well, the, your characters that you have around Agnes are all brilliant. And I mean, what's, what's amazing about the book is that it's, while it's sad, it is also completely joyous mm. about human courage mm. and getting on with things. And that's the most, I'm sure that's why everyone across the world just so loves Shuggy Bane, because you're rooting for Agnes and you're rooting for you. But you also, there's never a moment it feels that you're asking people to feel sorry for you. That's, well, thank you so much for saying that. I think that's life and that's the Glaswegian spirit. Sometimes, you know, first of all, it's a joy to write a working class story because you get to listen to a whole chorus of characters because people are going through the same thing at the same time. It's not mm. about just one individual. Um, it's about really a city. And you know, the Glaswegian spirit puts very opposing things next to each other. It puts incredible violence with tenderness and sadness with humor. And I wanted to create in every single chapter just an abundance of that humanity. I wanted to, to cram it in. But it is about people hoping and being resilient and coming back every single day and trying again. And through it all, loving each other. And I think that's the thing that readers have been able to connect with is the love and the hope and the resilience at the at the heart of it, rather than the themes that, that get swept up in the narrative. And that you tell a very good story that I've read or heard you say about when your own mother would be spiraling off, that one of the things you would suggest was that you took down her memoir. Hmm. And what That's happened? Right. Mm. You know, when you're a child of a parent who is suffering with addiction, you learn all kinds of tricks and strategies to make them less sad, to keep them in the room with you, to stop them harming themselves, whatever it is. And I think especially when it's your mother, you really want to take care of not only her spirit, but her body too. You want to really look after her as a young boy. And I learned at, when I was about seven or eight that one of the ways I could keep my mother's attention focused on me is if I wrote her memoirs and asked her just to tell her my story. She, was, she felt very much like a woman that was overlooked by society and sure, you know, history doesn't talk much about working class Glaswegian mothers. And certainly when they're suffering from addiction, we don't like a society to look. And so my mother would tell me her memoirs, but because she was drinking, she'd never get very far, but she always started with the dedication every single time without, without fail. And it was always to Elizabeth Taylor, who knows nothing about love. And that was remarkable to me. Here's this woman sitting, you know, in the East End of Glasgow telling this Hollywood star. But as an adult, I came to realize that Elizabeth Taylor embodied everything about my mother that my mother admired, you know? Mm -hmm. she was Elizabeth Taylor was never a meek character. 
She was mm -hmm. always very determined and strong and vibrant. And she celebrated love and losing love. And she drank quite heavily too. And then here was my mother in Glasgow doing exactly the same things and being punished for it. And so there was this sort of, uh, just this contrast of differences, I guess. And before we go, because I can see we're going to run out of time quite soon. The, <laughs> the men, the male characters, I mean, some of them, your brother, for instance, in the book, um, I mean, they, they are very varied lot, your men. Mm. It was a time, it was a time of great narrowness for men. And I think yeah. we, see, we see ramifications of that today. It was not a time where men could talk about their feelings or have any form of self-expression. You had to be hard working, hard loving, hard drinking and hard with your fists. And that has effects on everyone in the book. That comes down quite firmly in misogyny. It comes into homophobia as well. But there are two heterosexual men in the book that I think transcend it. And they're there for contrast. And one of them is Agnes's father, mm -hmm. who is actually a very big man, but he's incredibly gentle and adores his daughter above anything, mm -hmm. even though he does some things to try and correct her behavior. And then there's Shuggy's older brother, Leek, who is my favorite character in the book, yeah. who's a very gentle, sensitive, artistic young man who makes the biggest sacrifice in honor of his mother and his younger brother and doesn't tell anyone about it. Yeah. And so he's so giving as well. And and I, I wanted to create these two men as sort of against bright things against the landscape, I suppose. Yeah, no, I think that, that that's really interesting, you know, the fact that you say that men at that period, and to still to some extent, when you see the kind of hostile men's movement, have got trapped in very weird structures of masculinity, and they're very, they are very destructive, what they're in. Um, but so has Shaggy, has it changed your life? <laughs> I think I think back to the first question. I think it's trying to change my life, but right now I'm stuck on the sofa, and, uh, <laughs> and so it hasn't physically changed my life. But uh, as you as you said, I was a fashion designer. I spent uh, twenty years uh, actually managing quite large fashion brands in America, but I'd always wanted to be a writer. It was just never seen as a something a young boy like me should do, um, and that's how I went into textiles, Rosie, which then blossomed into fashion. And so in a way, publishing Shuggy has been about a dream furloughed for me. And I'm so grateful to be here in this moment. And I'm trying to make the, the, the pivot to writing full time. Um, and you've got another book coming out, though, I hear quite soon. I do. I hope so. Hopefully it's going to come out in uh, spring next year. Um, it's we're called Lock All. It is called Lock All. Yeah. So great name. <laughs> so I love it too. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry. And and we know because when we were chatting before we went on air that you're about to have a film soon of Shaggy Bane and it's going to be directed by Stephen Daldry, who in I, fact held up your script that you've yeah. written, which is, it will make the most wonderful film. Um, I think the role of Agnes will be a role that um, actors fight over because you could not have made a more complex, lovable, vibrant, just truly wonderful character. And Douglas, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And for anyone who has not read this book yet, go and get it. I, it is stunning. And it will leave you moved and informed and just uh, slightly blown away. So well done and thank you very much. And back to you, Daisy. Thank you so much, Douglas. Um, that was wonderful. And I know that New One Books do have some signed copies of Shuggy Bane. So um, if people want to order from them, then um, we'll put the details in the chat. Thank you very, very much for being with us from New York. And we hope to see you again soon when the new book um, hits the shelves. Um, and finally this evening, we are very um, pleased to be welcoming back uh, one of our favorite speakers at 5 by 15, Max Porter. He's always electric, and he is author of the acclaimed books, Lanny and Grief is the Thing with Feathers. Um, Max is very, very accomplished. He was winner of the Sunday Times PFD Young Writer of the Year Award and um, numerous, numerous awards for his writing. Um, and his new book is called The Death of Francis Bacon, which tells the story of the painter's last days, imagines the story of the painter's last days in a Madrid hospital. So he's dazzled us before with his stories and we are very pleased to have him back with us. Um, it's out this month and welcome, Max. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you all. Uh, it was a real joy to hear everyone speak this evening, to feel 
like I was in the same room as these incredible writers. Um, so the book is about Francis Bacon lying, dying, reckoning with himself and his work. Um, and it tries to create a painterly surface with language, therefore busy with lots of other ideas and history and memory and delusion and sex and practicalities, physical things. So it's a kind of sensory essay. And for 5 by 15, um, I've translated it outwards, um, further down the line or backwards to the point of encounter between a viewer and a work of art in real time with all the other rubbish that goes on uh, in one's own mind or, or in the room that one is in. Uh, and 5 by 15 have very kindly let me cheat a bit uh, and use notes so that I can um, whip along at the speed of thought or um, a bit faster even to create this kind of hyperbolic um, uh, encounter between myself and Francis Bacon. So this is me and this took place on Saturday the 18th of May 2019 in the Minneapolis Institute of Art at about four o'clock in the afternoon. I was supposed to be at Fiona's at six. I am supposed to be at Fiona's at six. I should turn my phone on and check the time actually, but I need a wee and my knees hurt. I think I've ticked my culture box. I think I'll just check this last room, the middle room here, and then, ooh, crikey, Mikey, don't look now. Oh, get in, straight ahead. There's a smack bang, middle of the 50s, iconic screaming bacon on that wall. Ooh. Hello, ducky. Thank God is my first thought. I need a wee is my second thought. A familiar face or a half face, an X face, a not face is my kind of deja vu, looping familiar afterthought. Ooh, would you look at that? It's an act of aggression against the idea of faces. I feel I'm at home in room 376 of this foreign museum. The screaming man could be David Sylvester, could be David Sylvester, could be a Pope. Teeth, eyelids, ear, collar, the white on that collar. It could be a hug from a long lost friend. I'm so happy to see it. God, I'm really bursting through the, it's boiling in here. I wonder if they do sandwiches down here. Let's get a look at you. Oh, yes, mate. I've seen three or four of these from this series in the wild, but this is a really good one. So, Jet lag, jet lag makes me feel completely mad. It, it affects my belly. I feel confused and emotionally strung out. And I said goodbye to my wife in New York and I was then up drinking till 4 a.m. with the playwright. And then my tenses started to be scrambled to so kind of before and after. And I've been awake since, maybe since I saw this painting in 1996. And then I was just crying in a diner and crying for no other reason. And the whole thing was so emotional and I was so nervous and being away is so strange. And, and then I went to the gala and I made my earnest speech and I met the famous poet and I was dressed like an estate agent in my shitty cheap suit and my crumpled shirt, very bacon to be a snob about the cut of a suit. Oh, Francis, year after year. Have I seen this painting before? Seeing this painting wrapped with a kind of political anger, rage, frustration, and no, 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 no. That was my previous visit to Minneapolis. Never to be forgotten because it was the 24th of June, 2016, the day after the Brexit vote. I'd been out with Marlon James. He'd said, oh God, I'm sorry, as he slid his phone over with the results of the referendum. And here I am name dropping, a very Francis Bacon thing to do. So did I mention I was with Marlon James? And suddenly in the gallery with the memory of Marlon James and the painting by Francis Bacon, I'm feeling a kind of rushing schadenfreude towards these corrupt Babylon Puppets made of Fortnum and Mason smoked, eaten pate, despicable fucks, as I would say. Ha ha, Francis, you are too much. I should turn my phone on and check the time because I'm supposed to be at Fiona's at six. But I suddenly feel with this kind of rushing desire to see them howling, shame ripped, disintegrated in the way he can disintegrate a person by horror at their own sickening, sterling, deranged, moral abjection, livid, strapped in a chair. All Bacon's popes like Alton Towers, roller coaster, pants shitters, just the right side of funny, not at all funny, clinging to their fragile shadows and their fake chairs, but it's history that's got, got to them. Not heights, not speed, not shame, mortality. A screaming hunk of self-imitating establishment meat. Always think of bacon when I look at Westminster abattoir for decency, screaming at Princess Margaret from the back of the room, rubbish, boo, like Bacon did. 
they can did that. You wouldn't ordinarily want to hurt a person's feelings, but these aren't persons, they're ghouls, they're props, stooges, zombies. Also, Princess Margaret couldn't sing. As we all know, she can't even bloody sing, as we all know. No, they're not even proper crooks. We love a proper crook, don't we, darling? Maybe it's the sheer joy of stumbling on a bacon this far from home, but I'm electrified, and I think of the series, this is probably the second best. Nostalgia's all over me like white spirit. I could go up in flames. Some of them were rubbish. He didn't wash the face out enough in some of them. There's a delirious desire to try and transpose this into prose. How would it be if I did that? Not like the Deleuze book, which is all kind of theory and control. Could it be done from the body? not from the mind. It would need to be very thick with his clever tricks, which is what he was. He was a clever trickster of interiors. The eighth one with the hands, that's a terrible picture. I hate that picture. God, I need a wee. God, it's boiling in here. God, snazzy chinos. God, I love American museums. When did he start selling them to American museums? I wonder if there's a loo on this floor. These ones, these are the start of Bacon's kind of self-imitation game. They're too close to fleshy, they're too cute. God, have I seen this picture before? Do they do sandwiches in here? Bacon loved Paris and Monte Carlo and Madrid. God, I love Europe. Have I seen this painting before? Have I been here before, racked with political anger and rage and frustration? Was it Bacon who sat with Jane Bowles while she died in Tangier? I should turn on my phone. I'm supposed to be at Fiona's at six. Not the institution, but the countries, the continent that we are in, the places, the cities, the people, our friends, the music, the painting, the food. God, I'm so hungry. God, someone, someone's farted. This not being England. I'm away from England. The fear of what we're becoming the English, but it wasn't then, it was this year, it was last year, it was, Christ, who stole a year? My knees are really sore after that walk. That woman's shoes are squeaking, just like a little hamster. In the same way we cannot ever look at a Velasquez Pope and not see a bacon tearing through. That's what history does. It tears through itself again and again. And in that exact same way, just as I cannot imagine now, that then I was 14 blocks north of East 38th and Chicago Avenue, which is where George Floyd was murdered. But that's the future, tearing through my memory of that day, like the screaming 20th century rips through a Raphael or a Tintoretto now, when we look back again. Again, when the represented event reminds us of the great machinery of pain or everyday murder by the state or the church again and again and again and again. God, that woman's shoe is making the strangest squeaking noise. But it was one year and seven days later that they killed George Floyd. So I couldn't have been thinking of him, but I know we discussed those deaths with my hosts. We talked about the relationship between art and death, which makes a change, and we talked about breath. American death and I know I asked about the strip bar and that guy being hauled out and how upset I was and they said such things happen every day in this city and I know we joked about buying lunch from Whole Foods and gentrification and Berryman jumping off the Mississippi Bridge and Twin City rap and trap and how hip-hop is the only living art form in the Bezos gilded throne room of exploitation and this was all very bacon but I hadn't seen the bacon yet. Bezos screaming past his first trillion playing aeroplane cockfights above the burning cities everything is very bacon when you're standing looking at bacon like he ripped that particular image out of a magazine printed 30 years after his death but I hadn't even seen it yet I hadn't been in room 376 yet I'm just still walking around this huge gridded city and I was thinking about the death of Prince a year before or even the year after the coming winter when Prince would die the everlasting life of Prince the never-ending death of Francis Bacon I was thinking about iron and grief because I was craving spinach and family and because he hadn't seen it yet, but he knew a thing or two about atrocity and my guts were crook. God, that woman's squeaky shoe. Can someone please lubricate that lady's sneaker? Screaming lost, sickening tourist on the loo, screaming George Dyer on the toilet or Muriel on the circle sofa or Innocent the Tenth on the papal throne or Eric on the pavement saying, I can't breathe. Or Francis in the room in Madrid saying, I can't breathe. Or every living animal in the greenhouse, hot shot to bits planet saying, we can't breathe. Fuck, I should turn on my phone and check the time. Or Harriet cut in half on the massage table, I remember that one. Or the late ball peering in, no, I can't have been thinking of that one because I only found that picture recently. I'm still in the past, representing myself, looking, thinking badly. Actually, I haven't even started thinking about this yet. I thought about it a lot when I was a teenager, but I don't think I've started thinking what would it be like if I wrote a book about this now and how it would have to be a kind of painful reading experience. People would possibly hate it. If it worked properly, it would have to be sticky and nasty, a kind of surface bursting full of itself, and then suddenly cuddly and kind of ultimately vicious. And I can't really imagine Faber being happy about that. I can't imagine how good this picture looked when it was all black and all he'd done is block in the white lines, the perspectival cage. And I wonder 
if it's an empty set. And I guess that's related to the scale of a painter or a lover being alone, painting alone like this, the sense of a different, less disturbing face behind the white one, someone asking nicer questions than Bacon is asking himself, someone like David Sylvester, like forgiveness, which is like a bad dream on a black background, which is like number seven in this series, which is in MoMA. Is that the one I really liked with both rows of teeth? Have I seen this one before where he really gets the scream? Like, you can hear it. Like, it comes at you like architecture and props, very lightly done, just single lines with a steady brush. You cannot look at that line and not lose your mind at how he handled paint. Teeth that will keep biting after rigor mortis, bite fresh as 50 sickness, granddad molars. He is all unease, all space. He's a carver. He's a virtuoso surgeon of emptiness. This is why reproductions of bacon are so laughable. You have to stand right next to me here in Minneapolis. Smell me. Ask if I can smell cedar or bergamot. I can. I can smell cedar or bergamot. It's that man. It's that real man. Opposite that unreal man, painted, not painted, death mask of Blake, painted orange murder mask of Trump. This was back then. And I'd say, look at that line. Compare that to number five, which you hate. God, my knees are hurting. Cartilage, ligaments, narrow bones, sockets, marrow bones, grinding yellow thickness of feeling, looking harder at it. Oil paint, rags, white spirit, terps, gold, velvet, incense, weird scraping, squeaking noise in my head. That could just be the jet lag. Naked foot in sneaker squeaking. That woman's foot. Oh, the way that yellow bunches at the first application like a mistake, like ecstasy, like a forever popping, electrifying. Fancy a person finding their medium like Francis Bacon found oil paint, fading, 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 straight like a machine did it, glitched like a man did it, copying himself thinking money in the bank. That's how I can make what I need to make. God, I need a way, but I can't quite bring myself to leave this painting. It makes me think about honesty and value. For some reason, this one makes me think of Rupert Murdoch. What now, old fella? Screaming old man, packing power and banknotes into a carry-on suitcase for the final journey, richer and more pointlessly powerful for the big deathbed interview. That'll make you scream on your throne. And I was wondering, when did Bacon start selling these paintings to America? So I checked the wall text, and then I did a thing which I do before I kind of erupted into this weird Cod Beckett two actors on a stage internal monologue with myself. When I see a Bacon in the wild, I leave the room and pretend I haven't seen it. And I need to sit down, so perhaps if that old man would vacate that bench, I could do that. Now consider me, 4,007 miles from home, trapped in the year before my dad was born, five years before my mum was born, one dead dad on the overseas floor, Quaker pain, angina disaster, Francis cough, cough, cough in the air raid, good early learning with the stable mates, Francis cough, cough, cough in the clinic, fakey cakey masks, toggle off old power, I'm hungry, I wonder if the cafe is open, do they even do sandwiches here? Anglo-Irish painter, American philanthropy, 307 days before George Floyd is killed, 14 blocks south from here, re-enter the painting, Trump calling white supremacists very fine people, re-enter 2019, Reese Mogg lying laughing on the green bench at the idea of children starving in this country. Very, very bacon. Odalisque with bloody hands. Throwback antique ghastly Mobius strip of meeting and re-meeting an image like this. Set against the newsreel a year before, a year after. Should I turn on my phone and check the time? One in a series of eight. Some crap, some genius misremembering, remembering. Have I been here before? Have I said all this to you before? Was I saying it about Crow? Show my workings. Step aside inside another image. Excuse me cultured Minneapolitans. I'm here to see my screaming accomplice, my pal, my good personal friend, study for portrait six from 1953. We are old friends, you see. Budge over, smelly bergamot man. My friend and I have a time travel argument in the diary because neither of us have been here before, but the world would erupt in a storm of purple velvet and scorched dead cod sci-fi fesh if either of us were to admit it. But first, cause this is bacon, be polite. Hello, you lovely thing. You gorgeous, nasty bastard, you perfectly horrible dental hygiene advert, stolen composition, stately, brazenly fake fancy us meeting here in your simulacra chamber in my head, in this neutral ground. I love your bright white collar. Thank you, dear. I love the white perspectival nothing room, joke room, cheat room, anti room, gesture room, you cello gag, I tear snag, he's screaming because you trapped him, smeared him, whacked him, attacked him with a smelly rag, you old wag. God, it's good to see you. I adore how still you seem. Maybe I should be getting going. I have to be at Fiona's at six. No movement after all. Stone cold, frozen still, like a topside in there, in the freezer. Those YBAs who ripped you off thought it was all about living things made dead. But actually, you were making dead things tricky living. Clever game for a morbid git. I should turn my phone on and check the time. God, I need a wee. And it doesn't take much 
I've just come from room 200, where Kondo Takahiro's cobalt blue Buddha drips and dries and cries, perpetually melting and drying in nuclear rain. And that is a conversation with material. Yours, Francis, is just a kind of lazy note to self, the European representational self, drenched in blood, exported, plucked from the very shallow plate of your life and mine. And I've lost track of time asking what it is that Bacon does. Do your knees hurt? Are you ashamed? Are you hungry? Are you horny? I should turn my phone on. I'm gonna be late for Fiona's. All this weird, weird human life behind glass in this country, on this planet, illusion, agony, things made of oil, metal, relics, weapons, casualties, very old fashioned, he always was. Save me from the ugly British mess. Give me some wide open Agnes Martin grids in the desert. Give me Martha, give me solar wit, give me queen minimalism and some melatonin gummies for my restless American nights. Make me not English for a little bit, I beg you, or I will scream and scream like Veruca Salt. Close personal friend of Francis Bacon, Roald Dahl, commonly known fact, and I'm hungry now, nostalgic, weepy, yearning for a good biography, a good 800 page biography of that fucker. My whole face is itchy with deja vu and unease about Francis Bacon and the future is his and the glass is so shiny and I miss smoking and I miss long argumentative drunk interviews between famous painters and intelligent TV hosts and I liked it when I had a big juicy death scandal secret with macabre taboo drops popping between ashamed and the naive and I wonder what time this gallery even closes how long have I even been here and I wonder if I could write about this and what would that need to be like I'm supposed to be at Fiona's for six and the man that smells of bergamot taps me on the shoulder and I turn and for a second he has the same screaming white emptied unface of the painting and I yell Wah! but that's not it's just my retina tricking me it's just my brain tricking me it's just francis bacon's paintings tricking me making fake noise in my head trying to add to the great effect bravo i bravo jet lag bravo francis bacon i just slipped and stumbled out of the polite confrontational norms within this strange ritual of looking at painted meaning rich surfaces fast forward and then yanked back no man in the room just ourselves disappointing failing curious interested stimulate me later confusable shouldn't you be going you late morbid tourist, you liberal snowflake melting for a cry on the wide streets of this foreign city because capitalism is so cruel. Wah! Buckle up, wimpy kid, rip that face off. This is indeed the world you live in. And the reason you like these paintings is because they get at it. The reason you should write about that, and if people think it's nasty, alienating shit, then great, pretentious, moi, Francis, they don't coolly appraise, they get at it and they try really hard and then they stop trying and then they remember why they were trying and they try again and Francis is saying, do it darling, but you have to be at Fiona's at six. Terribly rude to be late, especially when they're putting you up. You're just saying, are you all right? Seen anything good? Did you see my painting in room 376? Is it still working? Does it still hurt? Because you have a ritual, don't you? When you see one of my paintings overseas, you stop, you pretend to leave, you go in again. Does it hurt? Yes, it still hurts. You leave, you turn away, you go in. When you meet a bacon, you have a ritual. Again, leave, go back in. Does it still hurt? Yes, it still hurts. Look again, then leave. Max, thank you so much. Thank you for that incredible evocation of Francis Bacon and of your experience of looking at his painting, that was so wonderful. And you are always dazzling. And it was incredible to be able to welcome you back. And I'm just sorry that we can't hear the incredible applause that is virtually happening right now for you. And indeed, for all of our incredible speakers this evening, thank you very, very much. It was a huge honor to be with you all, um, Stephen Daldry and Amir Nizar Zuboy and Kate Moss and Douglas Stewart and Rosie Boycott and Max Porter. Um, it was just wonderful. And thank you for your generous support for 5 by 15. I hope you will buy the books and support the walk as it goes across Europe. Um, please do catch up with um, our podcasts and our films, which are coming out in the next few days and share them as far as you can. And please do come back and join us again very, very soon. Thank you all for joining us and good night. <laughs>